Stanford University. The panel we have now is talk about electricity and device. I think uh, this morning uh, you asked a really good question, how we decarbonize the grid, decarbonize the electric sectors. And uh, the opening panel already helped frame the things I'm going to say, so this make my life easy. But I have a Stanford all-star team, five players. Where's the missing one? Where's Michael? <laughs> oh, then I should say fantastic four instead of five NBA all-star team, right? <laughs> Michael is coming shortly. Uh, they are going to have another deep dive, really uh, bring different perspective to answer the question, how we decarbonize the electricity sectors, how we decarbonize grid. And uh, my name is Liang Ming. I'm the managing director for Bits and Watts. And the Bits and Watts is a affiliate program at Stanford. And uh, for the members coming from more than uh, a dozen industry members, global utilities, uh, IT companies, and the technology providers, we really coming together. About uh, two years ago, and uh, all the members globally, we organized a three months long webinar talk about decarbonize the grid. And uh, we analyzed different countries' decarbonization plan for the energy sectors. What we learned can be oversimplified to decarbonize the energy sector as a two strategy, very simple. The first one is electrify the energy demand as much as we can. And the second is introduce clean energy into the electricity sectors. And by seeing that, if we deep dive to each of them, introducing the renewables or clean energy technology into the electricity sectors, and by seeing that, a lot of them is what we call the invert-based technology. So we will look into the device side, the power electronic, how this thing works. And also, we introduce a lot of variable generations and a fast ramping rate electricity generations into the sectors. But the old Tesla and Edison paradigm has never designed to take this kind of fast ramping events for the systems. How we handle that? So you will have some conversation on this topic. Then if we look into the demand side, electrify the demand. We talk about the demand in the customer side, the transportation sectors, the industrial sectors. And we see a lot of distributed resources. They connect the introduced into the system. Very interesting is all of them are networked. So we can remotely control and monitor all of them. So you may he heard of the word the virtual power plant. What is a virtual power plant? How the virtual power plant works? So you will hear some answers today. And, uh, but we are under the fast and the tremendous technology shift for these sectors. In the meantime, we also have to respond to the climate-induced extreme events. Today, we have very beautiful weather here in California, right? Anybody coming from the Midwest, like Nebraska, Alabama, very likely, we're going to have the highest ranking of the, of the tornado events in this country this year, right? And if you go to Africa, go to Kenya, they're experiencing the flooding issues like we experienced in the winter, right, or some other parts. So how we respond to these climate-induced natural disasters? In the meantime, the rates is soaring in California. It's increasing tremendously. It's not just California. It's almost everywhere. How we keep electricity affordable, reliable, to all community at risk, okay? So by seeing that, today, I have my colleagues, I said, now it's a five, <laughs> five MBA all-star team we have here, right? <laughs> Instead of Fantastic Four. So my job is to make them awesome, okay? And uh, they will discuss more than just technology innovation, system engineering, but also the market innovation, the policy innovation as well. And uh, their research work represent a whole ecosystem investment across Stanford campus, which including the Precore Institute for Energy, and the school SDSS, the Accelerator, the Bits and Watts Industry aff Affiliates, but also a lot of federal and the state government investment into the Stanford. Without further ado, let me first introduce the first speaker, Inês Azuvodo a social professor of Department of Energy Resource Engineering, and also faculty co-director for Bits and Watts Initiative. Nish? Thank you so much. I don't think the mic is on just yet. Can you hear me? Yeah. So 
Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see some of the familiar faces and, and new folks joining in for this beautiful day in California. So um, I'll be speaking a little bit about some of the recent effort that we have on macro energy systems. Um, the two examples that I'll provide today is of work that has just been uh, submitted and, and completed, and we'll delve into two uh, quite specific questions. The first one has to do with, are we really achieving all the emissions savings that we may want to achieve as we grow the amount of renewables? And we're gonna be looking at two sites, two states, California and Texas. This is work that has been performed by PhD student Ruf Suri, um, my colleague Jack de Shalandar, and, and myself. And here's a little bit on the motivation. We all know that we want to achieve deep decarbonization for the power sector. This will require a very large scale deployment of renewable energy, such as wind and solar. Um, and currently, wind and solar generation across the United States is providing 14% uh, of total uh, electricity demand. California and Texas have quite ambitious goals for renewables. California with Senate Bill 100, uh, which provided a landmark policy, uh, which is hoping to have um, zero carbon sources supplying all of electricity by 2045. So can we achieve that? And Texas, which was uh, one of the states with the most ambitious uh, renewable portfolio standards. They are also the two states across the country with the largest demand for electricity. Now, the deployment of renewable resources is rapidly accelerating. It will result on lower system emissions and emissions intensity, but we do have a catch, and the catch is that the displacement is not going to be one-to-one -one with generation uh, from thermal plants. Why is that? As we have more renewable generation as part of our system, that generation is variable, and so we'll need to have the remaining thermal power plants cycling in a different way from what they did in the past. They will need to ramp up and down. They will need to be operating at different levels than what they did in the past. This would be all good if the emissions or intensity of the plants was constant regardless of the operation levels, but that's not the case. So here you see two examples, one moss landing uh, in Kaizo, a natural gas power plant, and then on the right, a coal plant in ERCOT. This sort of behavior is actually systematic across plants, though I'm just providing uh, the illustration of these two. The numbers 1A to 4A and 171B uh, and 172B represent two different units between the same power plant. The vertical axis is showing us the emissions intensity and the horizontal axis, the capacity factor. So you see if uh, the plants are operating at high capacity factors, which they were designed to do, they'll have fairly low emissions intensity. But we if we start operating these plants at low capacity factors, which they were not necessarily designed to do, we may have uh, emissions intensity that are several orders of magnitude higher. So we can have some emissions penalty as we go along. So here is a question. Our question was, OK, if we take those effects into account, how bad has this been in terms of what has been the penalty in terms of additional emissions as we need to cycle these plants. And so we take empirical data from plant historical operations to assess that. And uh, furthermore, can we provide an intuition of how this is likely to change as we grow the amount of renewables? So let's start with very simple cases. Here in these two plots, we show on the top, Kaizo, uh, California, and below ERCOT, Texas, um, annual emissions from all thermal power plants across time. And you see different bars. The navy blue bars that don't have any numbers on top of those represent the historical emissions that were observed from the data reported to the Environmental Protection Agency. And then we started by doing some simple scenario, which is, OK, what if we start needing to manage and operate the existing thermal plants in such a way that they will be operating at the emissions intensity uh, corresponding to their 10 percentile <laughs> of the observed distributions and the 90 percentile of the uh, observed distributions of emissions intensity. This provides us balanced scenarios on how good or bad can things get 
Um, of course, they are not going to be operating in that, those ways as a function of all the renewables, but it provides us bounding scenarios. And what those bounding scenarios tell us is that if we start operating those thermal plants in a really nasty way that they were not designed to operate at, the emissions could increase by 22% in Kaizo and 17% in ERCOT. Okay, and this across natural gas power plants uh, generation, we did something similar for, for coal. Uh, if we would operate them at higher capacity factors steady when they have low carbon intensity, this is actually pretty close, those are those green bars, pretty close to what we're observing already as the feature. And then just for sake of comparison, we use another emissions data source, which is eGrid, which is another uh, reporting from the public agencies. Okay, worst case scenario, we have those bounding emissions. Now, how bad has this gotten? And I'll go uh, very quickly over this, this sort of equations, but what we've done is we have data on the emissions and generation and emissions intensity of every single uh, power plant. And so we produced a regression model that relates the generation emissions and emissions intensity of each plant as a function of the generation of solar, of wind, and other control variables. Here's a little bit on the interpretation of those results. What we find is that if we were to increase solar generation in California overall, in between the state, an average natural gas power plant would see a reduction in 2.2% in their generation, but only 2.1% reduction in their emissions. The difference between these two numbers represent the fact that instead of being producing at optimal levels, they are uh, producing at suboptimal levels where they have higher emissions intensity. In other words, and it's good news, increased generation uh, from solar has been achieving 91% of its expected emissions displacement, and similarly, wind achieves 95% of its emissions displacement. Now, this is good news because we're also in California, a reasonable clean grid. When you look at Texas, we find that solar is less of an issue, and so generation and emissions are displaced in virtually the equal manner, but not wind. So we do see that as we need an increase in 10% in wind generation would require the average plant to respond by decreasing generation by 3.3% and the emissions by 3.1%. So once again, the difference is 91%. So overall, good news. So if folks uh, ask, okay, is it the case that cycling those thermal power plants is having a very big penalty and so we shouldn't pursue more renewables? Not really. We achieve the vast majority of the emission saving. There are some inefficiencies and we can anticipate that those inefficiencies and penalties will grow as we'll add more renewables into the grid and we have this aging uh, power plants cycling in ways that they were not designed to do. This is where research from some of my colleagues in terms of having stationary large scale storage will play a big role to replace those types of thermal generators and thus avoid some of, of those emissions. So let's tie now the needs of decarbonization overall in California for the power sector and the transportation sector. And so this is another study that we just submitted this week. Uh, this was with PhD student Madalsa uh, Singh, now Dr. Nora uh, Ennessy, who is now at ASU, Salah Seltzer, and myself. And here the question is, okay, if we do want to decarbonize transportation, that will mean we need to electrify transportation, most likely, and transition to electric vehicles. This is important for California. Transportation is the single uh, largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. It also accounts for a large number of premature deaths from uh, air pollution induced out of the tailpipe of those vehicles. Where here you see the different uh, types of sectors and emissions for California, and you see the prevalence of the transportation sector. So California has won an economy-wide a net zero emissions policy by 2045, but also a recent policy where every single new vehicle sold in 2035 uh, onwards needs to be a zero emissions vehicle. And we'll translate that to virtually adoption of electric vehicles. So from 2035 onwards, if this policy holds, new vehicles sold will be 100% uh, 
zero emissions vehicles, but we still have the current fleet to deal with. So our first question was, will this uh, policy be successful at getting us to net zero in 2045? And the second question was, do we need more policies to get there? So we developed a detailed stock and flow model that had the vehicle's characteristics all across uh, the vehicles in, in California. In the first plot, you just see simply number of vehicles uh, that are projected to be on the roads in California of different types, in gray gasoline, uh, blue electricity, and yellow all others, if the policy were not in place. So those would be the vehicles on the road. And below, you see the amount of annual emissions of CO2 if that policy was not in place. So the second step was how far can the policy get us? And so we simulated if from 2035 onwards, all vehicles sold, oh man, I see a lot of pictures there. Uh, all vehicles sold were to be electric, what would happen to the annual emissions? Okay, and so you see electric vehicles <coughs> increasing um, over time and the emissions decreasing over time. We account for the emissions from electricity, assuming the carbon intensity that the grid is expected to have in that year. And you see that it goes a long way just with these policies. So this is, this is great in terms of decarbonization of the sector. We don't get all the way to zero uh, in that sector. And the emissions will be larger if we fail to decarbonize the electricity sector. This is where those interactions become quite, quite important. So in addition to the current policy, what else could you do? We could move the sales mandate to an earlier year. Folks may not be very happy about this, right? There is some preparation that will need to be going on if we want 100% of those vehicles to, that new vehicles that are sold to be electric. There's another thing we can do, which is in addition to the policy that is already in place, we can retire the old vehicles, which are the ones with the nasty emissions. And so those are the two policy designs that we tested. We tested the effect of having uh, the policy onset of the sales uh, being earlier on. And we also tested the effect of having an additional policy which asks all vehicles that are 15 years or older, which have an overwhelming portion of the emissions, or 10 years or older, to be retired and provide an incentive to customers to do so starting in 2040, 2035, 2030, and 2025. And the answer uh, to what does a new policy get us is that if we were to indeed have a policy that starts retiring some of those old vehicles, it can get to zero. And so that may be something that is actually a low cost policy to be introduced and considered moving forward. So with that, I'll, I'll end. I'm probably a couple of minutes over time. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. So our next speaker, uh, Professor Megan Mauder and, uh, uh, at uh, uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. She is also the research director for the Department of Energy, Water and, Ener Water and Energy Nexus Hub. Excellent. Well, I'm um, fortunate to follow Inez because she really set me up here. Um, my name is Megan, um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about the work that our group has done on some of the cost and carbon benefits of flexible water system operation. Um, but before I go in that direction, I want to take a step back and just underscore the fact that we are seeing tremendous load growth. Um, that is a good thing, um, but it is also placing a tremendous amount of pressure on the grid. Um, and the result are decreases, or the potential for decreases in reliability, affordability, and decarbonization, as we just heard from Inez. Um, this load growth is largely peak load growth, um, and the uh, sort of growth is actually not homogeneous across the country. There are some regions that are growing really, really, really fast. And so the options that we have um, are honestly a set of not great options, especially in the near term. Um, those options are both on the generation side, like we have to do a lot of these things, but you know, they are, uh, it's an all of the above strategy, but doing it is hard, it's expensive. Um, and we also have a lot of limitations on the transmission and distribution side, um, which are uh, both policy related um, and permitting related. Um, there's been a lot of interesting work recently out of the DOE, both NREL and uh, OSED, 
thinking about how we might value um, DER resources, especially on the transmission and distribution side. Um, and what their work has shown is that um, these DER resources have the potential to be 100x cheaper, two orders of magnitude cheaper, um, especially in this next decade um, where we need to respond to this increase in, in peak demand. Um, there are also some very significant benefits in terms of how much um, renewable generation makes its way onto the grid, um, so reduced curtailment, um, as well as significant reductions in carbon emissions. Um, and so we are um, interested in understanding what the range of non-wire investment targets are. Um, certainly, we, we are aware that there's a lot of good ones, energy storage and virtual power plants and, and um, DERs being kind of the bulk of those opportunities in non-wire investments. Um, but we also want to be realistic um, about how slowly um, we are seeing adoption um, and implementation of these non-wire investments right now. And a large part of that is not an unwillingness or a technological um, mismatch, but really a um, market penetration problem um, and a love of analog controls, right? Uh, so, you know, we, we will get there uh, eventually, but in the next 10 years, um, we aren't there yet. Uh, that's especially true in the industrial sector. Um, and uh, in our group, we are specifically focused on the industrial sector um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that in industry represents, as we just saw from Inez, about a quarter um, of all load. It also has very large block sizes. So on average, it's 100 times the size of residential and 16 times the size of commercial customers. When you're talking about large scale industry, we, for instance, have done a lot of work in the um, water and wastewater sector. Um, this can be even an order of magnitude higher. Um, they are also the leading providers of industrial demand response, to, or industry is a leading provider of demand response today, um, but there remains a lot of untapped potential in industry. And so what our group is really focused on doing is developing a set of both powerful and flexible computational tools to understand how much um, latent energy flexibility exists within the industrial sector, um, how to schedule and control that load, um, to maximize benefits both for the grid and the industrial manufacturer, um, and then think about the um, balance of economic benefits across those two segments um, to understand how we can both change uh, the facilities, um, investing in additional flexibility potential, as well as redesign our tariff structures so that we maximize the amount and the value of that flexibility uh, to the grid. Um, so we've looked at this uh, in a couple of different sectors. We've started to, to think about food and beverage, chemical manufacturing, the nitrogen cycle. Um, but our core area of expertise is really in water and wastewater systems. Um, and Water and wastewater systems are particularly interesting because they are so large um, and because they are so untapped um, from an energy perspective or an energy flexibility perspective. Um, waste, water and wastewater accounts for about 6.2% um, in some regions, of California especially, um, and we're seeing very rapid growth in regional load um, sort of spread as we are um, facing an increasingly water-stressed uh, future. Um, electricity is the bulk uh, cost for uh, most water and wastewater treatment facilities. It's also a huge pain point for them. They have no idea how to manage those bills. They feel exogenous um, and out of control. Um, the vast majority of that, actually, is often demand charges. And they see this as like, hey, we can't, we can't control how much water we have to deliver. We just have to deliver the water. So we're not, you know, we're not focused on flexibility right now. Um, and because of the combination of increased load, um, new regulatory requirements on higher treatment standards, um, and increased uh, electricity costs, most facilities expect their total um, generation bills, or I'm sorry, uh, electricity bills um, to increase by somewhere between 30 and 100%, with more on the higher side. Okay, um, so we have um, been doing a lot of thinking too about um, not just how much flexibility exists um, in the water sector, but also um, how 
flexibility could be augmented by on-site generation. There's an enormous transition happening in the organic waste management approach across the country, um, where wastewater facilities are posed to become really centers um, for biogas, or I should say for organic waste management and biogas generation. Um, but most of today's on-site biogas generation is A, untapped, so 50% of facilities um, aren't actually producing any electricity from the biogas that they make, and it's completely unsynced with their load uh, that they're pulling from the grid. There's also a lot of really interesting storage options. So you can store water, you can store food waste, you can store fat, oils, and greases, you can store biogas, and then you can augment that with batteries. Um, and I would just reiterate that you know, about 50% of water treatment plants can meet 50% um, of their power demand without augmentation by food waste or other organic uh, sources. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go quickly through the rest of this work, which is really um, the more technical work that our group is doing. We're asking questions about what's the value of the flexibility um, within water facilities to the grid relative to existing energy storage solutions. So if you're shifting load around, how does it compare on metrics like RTE, energy capacity and power capacity? Um, and then we're asking from inside the facility, uh, what are the financial benefits of energy flexibility to these facilities? What's the motivation? Um, and is the motivation Aligned with grid benefits. So, what's the net present value? Um, you know, what's the levelized value of flexibility? What's the ROI? What's the levelized cost of water? Um, so, we've done this across the entire um, water supply chain, um, advanced treatment processes where you would shift load out of time of use. Um, periods, water distribution systems, uh, which I owe a tremendous thanks to Storage X for funding, um, and wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and ask these two questions for each of these facilities. I'm not gonna go into a tremendous amount of detail here, but I'll say that the levelized value of flexibility is net present value positive at most facilities, um, and many are incredibly cost competitive with battery storage. Um, the upgrade cost that we actually expect to see in terms of deploying flexibility is below a million dollars at many of these facilities. Um, far below a million dollars at most facilities, so you're actually really looking at this left-hand access, okay? There's a tremendous amount of untapped energy flexibility potential in the water system. Um, again, uh, there's also this additional energy benefit at wastewater facilities when we're talking about new investments in storage generation and controls. So I have a, a plant down in Watsonville, California that's a very typical plant. It's a five MGD plant. Um, you know, they spend about $600,000 a year on their energy costs today. They expect that to double in the next decade. Um, right now, they take wastewater, they take grid energy, and they flare biogas. Um, if they were to add generation back in here, you'd see a significant reduction. Um, if they were to also add some storage options, sort of optimized storage and control systems to time when that biogas is being burned, um, they would be significantly reducing their uh, total energy costs. This is both demand and uh, energy costs. And then if you add in there the addition of diverted organics, um, which there are state level mandates in California at least um, to see a significant growth in food waste um, going to wastewater facilities, um, this becomes a net present or I, I'm sorry, this becomes a net energy positive uh, facility, but also um, allows them to make the kinds of upgrades um, that they need to make in order to keep their rates steady. Um, I guess I would just end by saying that I, I think that there's an, an additional, uh, there really is an opportunity for wastewater facilities to become renewable biogas peakers, to, to send um, you know, renewable biogas onto the grid during uh, peak uh, periods of, uh, of need. Um, I just want to end by saying that, again, we're really interested in, in how um, industrial loads broadly um, are uh, incentivized across the country. So I've shown you examples from California, um, but we published this year a, a paper that looks at industrial tariff structures um, across at, at actually the 100 largest um, water and wastewater facilities across the U.S. It's a nice 
sort of indication of industrial load in urban environments. Um, and we've published that um, data set. Uh, it's available um, to anyone that's interested in using it. Um, and we're starting to think about the alignment or misalignment of those tariff structures with carbon intensity on the grid. Um, so just very quickly, this is hour of day. This is month of the year. Um, it's really intuitive, right? You, you have higher alignment in uh, sort of the middle of the day when you have um, solar, uh, et cetera. But, there's actually some interesting places where you have misalignment, and that's an opportunity for policy intervention and also um, new rate designs to encourage more of this industrial flexibility to make its way onto the grid. Um, so I just want to end by saying that um, we are really interested as a group broadly um, in thinking about flexible load and energy across the water supply chain. And we have a whole suite of tools that are available um, on our website, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. But with that, I'll end. Thank you, Megan. Uh, now we're going to switch gear a little bit, go to the power electronic. So our next speaker will be Professor Wang Rivers uh, from Department of Electrical Engineering. So th this session uh, was uh, great on devices. You're about to get a lot of devices. So uh, my name is Juan Rivas, uh, and I'm in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And thank you for the opportunity for, uh, I wanted to uh, have a chance to tell, tell you a little bit about my work. So I, I work at a much uh, lower level, lower powers, that like it's kind of like normally discussed in this kind of uh, forums. But what we're trying to do is to make uh, power electronics very efficient. And uh, so I, I guess like my goal uh, towards like decarbonization uh, is uh, an improvement of electrification is by making everything that you connect to the grid or any, uh, any energy source, make it more efficient. And I focus mostly on trying to uh, make power supplies smaller, uh, more dynamic, and uh, better yet if we can uh, like enable new applications through the use of power electronics. So uh, I don't know, guys, if you're familiar with like the, uh, po the power, what is inside the power supply in your laptop adapter or a charger or your uh, a vehicle charger, but normally have switches. And uh, it turns out that like the faster you turn those switches on and off, the smaller you can make a power supply. And uh, my particular area of, re of interest in research is how we can take those switching frequencies into the realm of megahertz, when most of what you find commercially is in the uh, kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz, perhaps. So um, I've been showing this for like several years now. Probably I need to update it. But like this shows what happens in power electronics. So uh, as we make, as I mentioned, higher and higher switching frequencies, we can reduce the size of power converters. So uh, this is some work that I uh, was presented in, in, in Switzerland uh, almost a decade ago, and shows what's kind of like happening. So uh, if we have a switching frequency of uh, 72 kilohertz in this power converter, uh, they deliver about 10 kilowatts or so. Like uh, they were able to to achieve a power density of around four and a half kilowatts per liter. So that you notice that like if you keep increasing the switching frequency to 250 kilohertz, you can more than double the power density, which is awesome. Like again, that's one of the the, the motivations for us to try to operate a higher switching frequency. If we were to double the switching frequency again to 500 kilohertz, you start noticing that we we still have an increase in power density but it's not longer doubling. So that's an indication that we're starting to reach a point of diminishing returns. And, if, and uh, I, I, I don't know, like every time I told my students to like do the layout of a new system at twice the frequency, it's really hard. So like uh, if we were to double the switching frequency again to one megahertz, so we start to have marginal increases in power density. So, it would be like questionable whether you want to increase the switching frequency again, because like for the effort, perhaps doesn't pay off in the reduction in size that you can have of a converter. But no problem. This is when technology comes to the rescue. We have uh, uh, two fantastic new semiconductor technologies, relatively new, not like they're a decade in commercialization now. But like, but like that's what it takes to commercialize semiconductors. So uh, two uh, semiconductor technologies, gallium nitride and silicon carbide, really opened the door 
to um, fantastic improvements in, in, in miniaturization and, and, and improvement on electrification. So the reason is, uh, and I uh, stole this plot from Professor Jim Plummer, the characteristic, electrical characteristic of both silicon carbide and gallium nitride um, show uh, improvements that are like up to almost three orders of magnitude of what you can achieve with regular conventional silicon technology. So this is one of the reasons that like in, in electrical engineering, there's so much excitement in uh, power electronics. Because uh, if you are giving a toy that can go a thousand times faster than you could do before, like uh, it gave us an, a, a, a lot of opportunity for research. And it's something that is becoming commercial, sort of. So uh, this is a, an example of uh, some systems that uh, are using now gallium nitride technology. Uh, you can buy these power adapters online now on Amazon if you have like those fancy chargers that you realize you need to buy a new one when you lost one and you're at the airport. And um, so they have like these new gallium nitride adapters that are much, much smaller than they used to before. And uh, even though they're using these amazing technologies, what, what you find is that like the switching frequency at which they operate at is not much higher than what was doing, what, like, we were doing before. Uh, using conventional silicon technology. There's many reasons for that. Like, like some of these devices do not scale down uh, um, if you operate a higher frequency. So you're stuck with the size of that capacitor, for example. But some of the devices do. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, like many of the available uh, gallium nitride devices are operating really at marginal frequencies about what is uh, available. And the reason is there is a lot of uh, things that we still uh, hasn't been optimized in this new semiconductor technology. So one of them that my group has been uh, focusing lately is called COSS loss. So as I mentioned, like the semiconductors, we are using them as on-off switches. But uh, uh, unfortunately, all devices have circuit parasitics. Like that's unavoidable, but that's keep, keep us employed. And uh, these, these semiconductors, uh, uh, parasitics, particularly the device capacitance across the semiconductor is normally considered lossless. And uh, it's included in um, like some of the simulation models that manufacturers provide, but it does not capture the type of losses that you experience in practice. So, uh, and it turns out that it's quite very significant. And I'm not gonna like bore you, bore you the, the details or how to measure, but I can give you like the implications. So like one of the work that, uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing in my group is figuring out, because this is not data provided by device manufacturer, we're trying to come up with inexpensive ways to be able to characterize that. But it is critically important, because if we are successful, there's a lot of fun things we can do. So this is an example of a module that was done for wireless power transfer systems, like commercialized by a company that was like uh, recently acquired by Infineon. And uh, they, give this to demonstrate uh, how you can design uh, high frequency wireless, tr wireless power transfer system. And uh, there, as a demonstration, this system delivers about 300 watts using the best of the best gallium nitride technology. And uh, they were able to achieve an efficiency that like is around 88%. And uh, every sem semiconductor, these gallium nitride devices are still somewhat expensive. So they're about $17 a pop. So, but this gave us an, a great opportunity for my group to show what we can do when we design things really well. So uh, one of my students, like he's now a professor at Penn, he was able to demonstrate that you can achieve something that is much more efficient. So this is, uh, this converter delivers the same frequency, the same power, the same input voltages that uh, that system that is commercial. And he was able to, to achieve a whopping 96% efficiency. And what he was amazing, he, was, he only needed conventional, old-style silicon technology. And the reason is, even though silicon uh, has characteristics that are, uh, are not as, uh, as um, fancy as like what gallium nitride are, we understand it really, really well. And like the models, capture what you can see in, in, in practice. While in gallium nitride, the current models are not there. So we can do something that is much, much smaller. So like these are $2 a pop. 
And you can achieve an efficiency that is much better, something that is actually quite surprising. But nonetheless, gallium nitride does have amazing promise. So like we um, went to design, like knowing what we know and how to model these devices. We took the gallium nitride devices and tried to design the best we could do. And it turns out that like you can, instead of 300 watts, you are able to deliver uh, wirelessly. So this is a demonstration that we thought it was kind of fun. So we were able to deliver about 1.7 kilowatts of power, like that's starting to be enough to be significant for, uh, uh, like for, 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 for interesting applications, perhaps some like uh, e-mobility applications. We can deliver things uh, like power at a rate of around 1.7 kilowatts with an efficiency that exceeds 90, 95%. Uh, which is like, uh, like compared to what we could do in the past, like to be honest, like pretty amazing. But uh, and, and lastly, and super briefly, something like a, an area that my, my group is working really is uh, a lot recently, is one of the things that like uh, we have in power electronics is that we depend heavily on capacitors and inductors, and the inductors tend to be big and bulky. So one of the things that my group is trying to investigate is that if we can replace them with piezoelectric materials. And it turns out that like in the very certain circumstances, it turns out this is possible. So we're having a lot of fun like uh, going to the nanofabrication facilities here at Stanford to use uh, lithium niobate um, piezoelectric materials in which we electroplate conductors. And then um, these are piezoelectric. So this, uh, you uh, put some strain and it produces a voltage. But we can use them as inductor under a very narrow um, applications. And we've been able to use them as power converters. So we have a project that has been supported by like the Bits and Watts uh, uh, affiliate program here at Stanford. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Thank you, everyone, if you're part of it. And uh, with that, we've been able to demonstrate like this really uh, 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 outstanding groundbreaking work that are able to show that like on their narrow uh, uh, space of applications, we can model these piezoelectric resonators that like um, our initial tests were not as uh, great as we thought, but like we were able to demonstrate to show what we need to fix. And we are able to, to measure um, like these resonances that are not supposed to be there that happens due to the fabrication but that we were able, by uh, careful engineering and collaboration with uh, uh, some colleagues in other universities, we were able to uh, demonstrate things that are starting to become real. So we built this um, resonator that is like about uh, an inch on the side, that we are able to pretty much have almost ideal inductor characteristics at this point. And we put this in a converter. So like this is a power converter that is about the size of your laptop adapter. That is about three kilowatts. Uh, uh, and um, and op has an efficiency that they exceed 97%. So like it's something that like start to become, uh, they're still far away from like something that you can find commercially, but it, it I think it shows a lot of promise. And like uh, it's starting to be uh, competitive to other uh, 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 charging technologies for, 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 for many applications. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Wang. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Ram Rajakoba uh, from uh, Civil Environmental Engineering, also another faculty co-director for Bits and Watts. Wang. Hi. Good morning, everyone. So. Um, in my group, we really investigate how do you plan and operate energy systems that utilize a lot of distributed energy. That's where we started. Today, I want to talk specifically about the planning side. So the first thing is we know that one of the imperatives of our fight on the climate change is to uh, decarbonize the energy system and also decarbonize a lot of the energy usage. And the main strategy for that is electrify and decarbonize. Wow. The idea is fairly simple. If I add up transportation and buildings, that's roughly 30% of all of our carbon emissions. And then the grid is 35%. If I move that 30% on the transportation and buildings into electricity, and then I decarbonize the electricity sector, 
then I have removed 65% of carbon emissions. So that's the story. What's actually been happening, if you, if you read the news or look at reports from the DOE, NREL, and so on, is that things are changing at different speeds. So if you look at the actual energy system, I have on one side generation, I have a set of pipes for long distances of transmission, I have our local distribution pipes, that's the distribution grid, and on the other side, the end users. We are seeing an accelerating change on generation. We see a lot of deployment of wind, solar, and attempts to grow it even more. We don't see nearly as much change on transmission and distribution, and that actually is making it uncertain how fast we can actually change on the end use side. And in, in order to kind of understand the, 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 the type of challenges, it's also useful to think about the goals that we have for, for our energy system. One is at the top, decarbonization, and at the same time, we are asking, well, as you decarbonize, as you make all these changes in generation and uses and transmission, you need to do it in an equitable way. Um, this notion of equity is not super well defined. It's something we are learning to define right now. And at the same time, climate change is already happening, and we are seeing the impacts of it in all of our infrastructure, electricity, for example, infrastructure. And so we need the system to be climate resilient. So we are all comfortable with this idea. We need to be decarbonizing in an equitable way and climate resilient. So the first thing is planning today does not account for all of these three. And we saw some of the speakers before saying, you know, OK, if I try to even address one of them, it's, it's pretty hard. But on top of all this, it's very important to remember the whole grid was designed for reliability. We have to ensure that the electricity services are delivered 99% of the time or something like that. So we have these four constraints. And the issue is when I try to do planning, taking all of this into account, I have to start thinking in different ways. And one of the key things that, that we have been learning is these new tools that we need to design, they're going to have to use a lot of open data, uh, AI and ML, to fill in the gaps of what the data doesn't provide, and a lot of stakeholder participation. Because we are injecting a lot of new technologies, we have objectives that were not accounted for before, and right now we don't even have appropriate processes to integrate the solutions we come up with into practice. So let's look at some of the research we have done illustrating this point in, in, in the various parts of, of my initial figure. Let's start with the end use. And I decided to focus a little bit on, on solar. So one of the things that, that we had heard from some utilities that are in bits and watts is, well, we don't really know um, where all our solar is. And more importantly, even if we knew that, we don't really have good models of predicting how solar adoption is going to happen and what's the impact of policies and so on. So our students got together and they basically figured out that you can build a data set about all the solar panels in the United States by using satellite imagery um, and deep learning. And using that data, they were actually able to build very accurate models that understood impact of different policies. So for example, they found that tax-based incentives are not very equitable. They lead to inequity. They found that uh, commercial installations tend to be much more equitable, meaning if I look at number of installations per 10,000 people in areas of disadvantaged communities and non-disadvantaged communities, and I look at commercial solar, then the difference between those two is pretty small. And so one of the things that we learned with this project that was super important is you can build these models, and immediately the first thing that's very striking is um, the large data allows you to tease out which levers are making either your system become more carbon free or more equitable, for example. The next question we had, and this was a result of a project where we were actually controlling real DERs in, in places like uh, Fremont and so on, was to actually understand what, what is the actual benefit of distributed energy resources and control. And what we discovered is people haven't even looked at the actual detailed impact of simultaneous changes on the electrification side and the distribution grid. And so what we did was a simple study, but that 
was very expensive computationally. We took something like 30 distribution grids, which are all published and open. We attached to it all of the electrification trends on heating, cooling, transportation, et cetera. And that allowed us to model the impact those would have on the grid. And what we saw were things like what's shown here in the picture. Um, if we don't do anything and electrification just happens, we would have about 80% of the transformers being overloaded by 2050, and by 2040, 65%. But if you actually enabled some sort of coordination, like uh, Megan, uh, Ines, and, and talked about, you can actually avert that and, and, and reduce that to something like 40%. So it's pr profoundly impactful. The next question we had was, well, how actually resilient are these distribution grids? And in order to understand that, the first thing is, as researchers, we don't really have access to all of the distribution grid data. These are all data sets that are locked in different places. So our students took street view data and created mechanisms that are all published as well that allow you to basically map distribution grids anywhere in the United States and even in Africa, we have done that. Um, and once we did that, we created an indicator called the undergrounding rate. What is the rate in miles? What percentage of your miles in a certain region is underground? Then we were able to relate that undergrounding rate to things like wildfire protection, how far is the vegetation from the lines because you use computer vision, and we were able to determine how vulnerable the grid is to, is to wildfire risk as one example of climate. And here's one result that, that's in this paper um, that basically shows something really interesting. First of all, undergrounding rate grows as income grows. And not only that, it's completely uncorrelated with wildfire risk. So that's, again, an equity issue. But in this paper, we were able to propose a policy mechanism that allows you to correct this problem by just using different cost sharing to determine where to underground. The last uh, two things I, I want to talk about is, one is there's this question about what is going to be the future reliability of our electricity system under various climate scenarios and so on. And we discovered there weren't really good models that are publicly available for that. So one of my students, Tao, built this data set with 10 terabytes of data. He went to even the San Francisco City Library to get old books and scan them to get data on utility reliability, utility undergrounding, investments. We got all the climate data, et cetera, GIS. And we built an enormous data set that allowed us to learn, for example, here's one example, this predictive model for the number of minutes per customer of outage that, that you, you might face um, as we go through the different years under different climate scenarios. And here we run the various climate models and so on. The most striking thing to me is that very clearly, these black dots are actual data. So for example, this particular year, there were 600 minutes of safety total per customer in the United States. As we go to 2030 and so on, these numbers are ballooning a lot. So it means we do need to make investments in resiliency. And the models also help you see how to do that. The last thing I want to talk about is this issue that we all see in the news. There is a huge transmission interconnection backlog. So now I'm moving into the generation and the transmission side. And Basically, if you look at interconnection queues, which are requests from developers to, to say, I want to build a project of a certain type in a certain location, uh, there is much more energy capacity in the queues than even the existing capacity by many orders of magnitude. And the reason that happens is because, well, these project requests fail 70 to 80% of the time. And by the way, the project completion rates range anywhere from four years to seven years. So if you're talking about electrifying everything and, and decarbonizing by 2035, we have to sort this out. And why is this happening? One of the issues is lack of an open data, open models, and clarity on methods that allow people to de-risk their ability to analyze these investments. And here at Stanford, we have started working in partnership with Inez, Liang, and a few others on things like for example, multi-value expansion planning. 
So we have developed algorithms inspired by machine learning that can accelerate solutions for these planning problems by 100x and take things into account such as emissions, rate, rate payer prices, and so on. The last thing is that one of the things that was most exciting about this line of research was that we started getting asked by various sorts of stakeholders, utilities and, and, and uh, developers and so on, can you provide the data, the methods, can you come and implement them? And what we decided to do was to create this entity, this company startup called Gridcare. And basically we're taking all of this research and putting it into a platform here. Amit, who is the CEO, is sitting right there. And it's, it's super exciting to actually now try to make the transition of we have all these tools that help you analyze the system and, and make it in a very fast and open way. How do we now, in practice, try to help people reduce their interconnection time from six years and a half to, to, to something much faster? OK? Thank you very much. Good. Last but not least, and uh, uh, Ram, Wang, and uh, Megan and Inesh are going to stay to the end to engage a group conversation. And uh, we have a last speaker, and uh, uh, Professor Michael Wara, and uh, Senior Policy Director for the Stanford Sustainability Accelerator. Thank you for, for having me. It's wonderful to see so many friends in the audience. <laughs> um, I run a group at Stanford that's um, quite multidisciplinary. I'm an energy lawyer and climate scientist by training and work with colleagues um, both in the legal field and also across a number of disciplines that relate to energy policy on um, applied energy policy problems, um, developing po solutions that we think are helpful and implementable in the near to medium term. Um, the I'm going to talk about three related, we, we think of them as related anyway, um, projects that we're working on um, at present. One uh, funded by um, Bits and Watts is really focused on uh, developing solutions to improve, thanks Liang, I appreciate it, um, to improve transmission affordability um, in the United States. So we've seen a lot of innovative proposals um, today and, I'm, and, and, and I think there are others as well to improve the interconnection process, hopefully to improve transmission planning I think the reality, certainly in California, where we're confronting strong you know, constraints related to affordability, is that building more faster has implications for bills and rates that, that complicate the process. And so we need to find both opportunities to improve the efficiency of the process and also ways to bring more money into the process that's maybe not ratepayer money, non-utility money, um, but that also doesn't upset the utility business model in a way that will prove unacceptable politically. And so we're working um, with, um, you know, funded by Bits and Watts um, with a number of policymakers on developing detailed ideas around what we call a renewable energy transmission authority proposal, which will essentially facilitate, um, a, a create a state authority that would facilitate um, siting of new transmission um, perhaps where utilities um, choose not to construct it, perhaps um, coordinated with um, areas in the state of California where there are real opportunities or outside the state of California where there are real opportunities for new uh, renewable energy generation that don't face the level of siting conflicts that are occurring, starting to occur in certain areas. Um, we're also, we, we're, we're a big believer in the, the value of regional coordination on um, as we move toward uh, greater renewables integration. And we've been doing work um, related to that, um, evaluating the reliability impacts of regional transmission operations. So currently, folks may or may not be aware, there are a number of initiatives across the Western United States to create a regional um, uh, transmission operator. There are actually two kind of competing proposals. One that is kind of California-based called the Pathways Initiative. Another uh, being led by SPP, which is an RTO, a currently existing RTO based in Arkansas um, that has been doing things in the West for a few years. Um, and a number of the analyses looking at these proposals, actually all the analyses looking at these proposals, are really focused on the economic benefits 
of the proposals, mostly to transmission owners and operators um, and to generation. We're instead focused on what we think is probably the most important aspect of these proposals, which is what happens during a crisis. How can we, how can we improve our ability to manage through shortage events on the grid? And our work is focused on evaluating the difference of going, to, going from a system today where you know, when the California independent system operator is short power, they're essentially picking up the phone to try to call other balancing authorities across the West to find available capacity on a hot summer afternoon to a system in which the system is optimized regionally. There's much greater transparency of information across the WEC about available resources so that those can be optimized in a much more cost-effective manner to not so much to improve the economic outcome, but to avoid what I think is the most politically significant outcome that we would see a system blackout that would be associated with renewables. And so where our work is really focused on this reliability angle to um, the Pathways Initiative in particular, but also to the broader effort to regionalize the system. Um, we have a large portfolio of work focused on wildfire. We actually got into working on wildfire because we work in the energy space in California, and obviously it's been a problem over the last seven years or so. I would say actually a decade. Um, the two projects that I'm, I'm most proud of and most excited about that our group has been working on um, are, are one, uh, focused on moving what we have learned in California through hard and painful lessons with respect to wildfire mitigation planning and implementation to a west-wide framework. Next uh, Tuesday on the 7th, we'll be launching a, a, a data product and a, and a working paper that's the first synthesis of wildfire mitigation planning maturity for all investor-owned utilities across the, United, uh, across the Western United States. So we're gonna show where do different utilities stand in this space? Who are, who are the winner, who are the people that are leaders really getting ahead of the problem? And who maybe need to be pushed a little bit, either by their commission or we frankly think by their bondholders. Um, the, the utilities that have not moved fast enough have at times faced very painful lessons. I think it's pretty clear from the California experience what the early steps are in reducing your you know, wildfire uh, risk for a distribution system and a transmission system. And at this point, there are a number of low cost steps that utilities across the West can take. We're gonna highlight those and show exactly where people are on that spectrum of maturity from doing nothing and just hoping for the best on a hot summer afternoon or in Colorado's case, a cold, dry, windy winter day to, um, to, to being confident that you know what to do and you can actually implement op especially operational changes to dramatically reduce risk during those circumstances. The other th policy initiative that we're working hard on is, is, is working to recognize, to create um, proposals that are implementable that recognize that wildfire risk is not, not just a utility problem. The reality in uh, California is that we spend about 10 to 20 times as much in the utility space trying to reduce wildfire risk as we do everywhere else. It's about $10 billion in the utility space, depending on the year, two to 500 million on reducing risk in other ways. We think that is likely to be highly ineffective and highly cost ineffective, particularly as affordability becomes a major challenge in California. And we've been working on policy proposals to take the lessons learned in the utility space and move them into the broader state planning um, that, that is occurring, but highly imperfectly, um, not in, with, with much less data and much less quantitative risk-based um, evaluation of options. Um, in, the, in the kind of state planning, CAL FIRE, U.S. Forest Service um, space. That proposal has, been, has gained a lot of traction and is actually a bill at this point in the California legislature. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, all bills are, you know, I'm just a bill, right? Um, the, the other silo of work that we're particularly excited about and where... Um, we have a really active collaboration with the team at Bits and Watts, and we're really grateful for the support and the collaboration. Um, really is concerns affordability. California, the, 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 there's sort of two phone calls that people, elected representatives in California, whether they are the governor or a legislator, get these days. First phone call is, I just lost my insurance, right, because of wildfire risk. 
Maybe there are people in the room who've had that phone call, who've, who've experienced that. Second phone call is, I just got my electricity bill and I'm pissed. Do something about it now. And the two are actually related um, and, and, and really inform our work. One of the biggest impacts in electricity bills or driving rate increases in rates is the cross subsidy from uh, rooftop solar customer or from people who do not have rooftop solar to those that do. Essentially, the rooftop solar customers, like myself, avoid grid costs. And, and, and well, actually, not quite like me. I have batteries, which we're going to talk about. But the, the, the proposal we're working on, supported by Bits and Watts, is really to think about how can we reduce that cross-subsidy in ways that are politically feasible. What has proven very hard to do in California is to kind of redo the deal that existing rooftop solar customers have. Like, you know, the, the, the sense that people have is a deal is a deal, can't take it away. Um, our proposal that we're evaluating is a system to use resources outside of rates to basically induce customers who have solar only and have this very special deal that has been grandfathered in that's costing everybody a lot of money to install a battery, to use to, 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 use to self consume rather than to push energy onto the grid when the grid doesn't need it and take it back when the grid really does need the energy. We're also interested in evaluating whether these, if, if this subsidy were to occur, whether these, these batteries could be operated as a virtual power plant. So sort of combining, stacking a variety of things to create societal value and reduce the cross subsidy that's really dri one factor driving rate increases right now. Um, another policy idea that we're evaluating involves the use of California's cap and trade allowance revenue. People may have noticed Probably they didn't, because who reads their electricity bill? It's really complicated. But they got a little climate credit this month on their electricity bill. I got, I think, 50 bucks. Um, that was nice. I, I appreciated it. Thank you, PG&E. Um, but the reality is that there are a set of people uh, who are more heavily impacted by the rate increases that are occurring in California. They're, in general, low-income customers in hot climate zones. And the proposal we're evaluating is whether we could reallocate that climate credit that kind of accrues to everyone across the, the rate base today, uh, or the customer base today, to the people that are most heavily affected by these rate increases. And where there's, frankly, you know, for me, it's an affordability concern for a low-income single mom living in Bakersfield, it's a life safety concern, particularly if she happens to have a grandparent living in the house. Right? And folks in those contexts really are struggling to pay their bills. Bill of rearage is sort of spiraling, maybe not out of control, but it's growing rapidly. Um, I think the statistic I heard from Turn is that 25% or 20 to 25% of customers are in bill of rearage at this point across the California custom, uh, residential customers. Um, and so we need to find ways to help the people that are least able to afford the costs that are occurring because for a variety of reasons, some of which involve decarbonization, the need to invest heavily in distribution and transmission system upgrades over the next few years, some of which involve wildfire risk, kind of climate adaptation problems that we're struggling to manage. Um, and, and we think that rethinking how our cap and trade revenues are utilized in the state could be an important source of new money to solve some of these problems, or at least contribute to the solution of some of these problems. So that's another issue they're working up a detailed policy proposal on at this point. Um, what I'd say is our hallmark is multidisciplinary teams working together. We really strive to build teams of lawyers and postdocs and graduate students that can solve these problems in ways that are practical, that are useful to policymakers, that result in real change on the ground. Um, and I think. I have to go teach energy law, so I have a few minutes for questions, and then I have to run out of here. Um, thank so you very much. What we're going to do is open the floor for Q&A, since uh, uh, Michael, is, <laughs> Michael is has to leave in about two to three minutes, so he will take uh, maybe one or two questions from the audience. Let's open the floor first, then we'll go to the question to the rest of the team. Go first, you second. What are your biggest needs around equity and underserved communities? There are so many challenges for equity in California. And, and I, I, I start every conversation about the challenges in energy affordability by saying the real challenge is housing. Um, and energy is layered on top of that. 
but I think that the the biggest challenge uh, right now, there, I would sort of list two. If, if we work closely with environmental justice groups and are close partners with with EJ organizations across the state, um, energy affordability would probably be issue number one. How do we help, especially these low income households in hot climate zones, afford to air condition their homes? It's as simple as that. Um, and, and you could say, well, there's, we need to upgrade the housing stock and improve energy efficiency. All that is true, but then there's this summer. What do we do this summer and next summer? And the reality is all of that is a multi-decadal housing issue, and we should work on that, but we also need to help people now. Um, the other issue um, in terms of equity concerns, I, I would argue, and this is one we're not working on yet, but we have an interest in working on, is how to... Actually, you know, there, if you talk to environmental justice groups, they'll say, what about the gas plants in EJ communities? We need to be, we have a, we supposedly we're going to close these plants, um, you know, via court decisions, especially the ones through cooling plants um, some time ago. We haven't done that for reliability reasons, which are real. But we need to actually develop plans about what we would need to do in order to close those facilities and replace them with alternatives that do not create the same kind of equity and environmental justice concerns, but are affordable and real. And I think that would be a second concern that I would highlight. Thanks, Michael. I, you have a fascinating group of people working together, it sounds like. Um, my thought went to, when you were talking about the bill and getting the word out and people calling the legislators um, is what community organizations are you working with um, there's a f couple that come to mind, Citizens Climate Lobby, a few others that I know that are really into getting pe folks to call or to email, really up the number of t touches mm -hmm. that the legislators mm -hmm. get to try to make momentum yeah. on these bills. Well, so this is a thing where, you know, we have to respect our lane. Yeah. I, don't, I don't lobby for legislation. I'm gratified when our policy ideas are, are adopted into legislation. And I'll certainly answer questions from policymakers if they have them. But you know, we, are, we in general don't like organize. Um, we try to answer the questions that environmental justice groups have, other, other climate advocates have, and, and, and bring the resources that Stanford has to bear on problems. But I tell you that our bill, you know, the biggest problem with any legislation this year is money um, in the state of California. And so we're working on, you know, we, we've been thinking about are there ways to reduce the cost? Uh, you know, even if something saves you a billion dollars, if it costs $5 million this year, that's a problem in the legislature for a new program. And so we've been thinking creatively about ways to try to reduce those costs. We've been really gratified that the legislation that I mentioned has been endorsed by both the insurance industry and the, the joint, all three IOUs. Um, and so it's got a lot of support. But, you know, there's no money. Like, uh, people are, you know, not ordering paper and uh, they're not ordering office supplies in state government right now because of the money issues. Great. Uh, Michael? I could take one more if that's, one more. and then okay. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> this is about time of day pricing and whether that offers an opportunity for uh, heat stressed low income communities to pre cool um, if the uh, price <laughs> during the peak uh, of the peak of the sun, midday price were lower because at least in my bill they're not that much different. Um, you know, yeah. 10, 15, 20 percent different, <laughs> but not enough to really change behavior. And I wonder if you guys have looked at first of all why is this time of day pricing proceeding so slowly, and how could it help this problem you've identified of heat stress in low income communities? Well, I just note that. Um, what, what was termed highly variable time of use rates, like more like the EV rate in California, or I have an EV2A rate where I live um, in my home, and that's a much more variable TOU price where the, the difference between the off-peak and the on-peak is large, was something that was recommended by the president of the Utility Commission in her decision around NEM 3.0. Um, the, sorry to get wonky with folks who don't know what that means, but basically the president of the utility commission was saying we need to have this big difference between off-peak where we have today, it's like 22 gigawatts of solar on the Kaiso grid I was looking earlier, um, and, and, and on-peak at 8 p.m. when that solar is not producing energy. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a general trend in California. It takes a long time to change rates, um, rate structures. There's a lot that has to happen 
to make that equitable and affordable. And in particular, I think the challenge there is that pre-cooling works great if you live in energy efficient housing, like tight building envelopes that are, that are well insulated. But for low income people, you know, they live in like, we work with people who have swamp coolers in the Central Valley, right? You know, it is not the same kind of housing stock that I am blessed to live in. And so I think we need to be careful there. Um, but I generally support that move too. I, I just think we have to pair it with the kinds of, uh, we, we need to make sure that people can actually do pre-cooling, for example, in a meaningful way. Um, and some people can, some people can't. Um, that's a process, you know, you quickly get into sort of questions around housing policy that are really thorny. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm in, I in general agree with that sentiment. Thanks, thanks very much. Sorry, I have to run. Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so now we will take a little bit longer, so we have about 15 minutes. Then uh, let me open the floor. I think a lot of people already raised their hand. I have a list of questions. I will, re I will reserve the rights to ask my questions, but I will let you guys ask a question first. Uh, first here, second is there. Thank you. Um, this is for Maureen. I was really excited to see your slides. Um, I work for Phoenix Energy, and we build bioenergy with carbon capture and storage plants here in California. And our second plant, uh, we just commissioned our first this month. Our second one will be co-locating with a water, wastewater treatment facility, the Calaveras County Water Facility, and we'll be um, powering their pumps and they'll be giving us water to cool our engines. So it's a very synergistic relationship and it was great to see Stanford Mines on the problem. Thank you. Great, it's a comment and a question there. Mehdi, <clears throat> Mehdi Ganji, pg e Microgrid Strategy. Um, I have two questions, one for Megan and one for Juan actually. Megan, what's the percentage of the residential uh, water demand on the water and wastewater uh, process? And if you see an um, impact of the water demand uh, site management of residential sector in the water operation. Uh, for Juan, uh, I'm not ignoring your great work here, but one of the issues that we have when it gets to battery and solar is the amount of energy that we lose uh, in inversion of DC to AC. Um, I'm trying to find out what prevents the industries, specifically server manufacturers and data, data center manufacturers, uh, to build a DC system rather than uh, putting out AC system, which requires converter and um, switching. Nice. Thank you. Megan, you go first. Okay. Then, yeah. um, so the water system, um, where energy is consumed in the water system is highly dependent on the, the unique attributes of specific water grids, transmission, treatment, distribution, wastewater treatment. Um, across the US, about 90% of energy use is in transmission, um, not in treatment today. Uh, the numbers I presented here were treatment specific, so wastewater treatment and drinking water treatment. Um, there's an additional huge load, of, again, associated with that, that distribution and then transmission. I mean, the State Water Project is the, one of the largest DR providers in the state of California, for instance. Um, your question is specifically about heating. Um, there was not any heating numbers, residential like water heating numbers in that, but if you include water heating in the entire sort of energy consumption around the water management, that, that percentage of total load skyrockets to about 20, I think it's about 20% of total load if you include residential heating. Um, I think that there's certainly a huge opportunity for a paradigm shift in more distributed um, and, and hybrid um, water system management akin to the transition we've seen in the energy sector where you have building scale water and wastewater reuse that allows for you to eliminate a great deal of that, those transmission um, energy and, and costs. Uh, we do a ton of work on that in other parts of my lab and the center that I direct called the National Alliance for Water Innovation is really structured around how to enable small scale distributed desalination fit for purpose reuse. Uh, but I, I think from an energy flexibility perspective, um, there's two big questions that sort of 
get brought up. The first is how that load, that distributed load at a building scale gets integrated into all the other building scale systems um, that are likely to also need to operate um, fairly flexibly. So that's question number one. I mean, you obviously have le less storage in a building envelope and much higher costs associated with that storage. The second big um, the question is then really, I think, about organics management. You're never going to do that in a distributed way. You're going to do that in a centralized way because of true economies of scale. Um, and so it's really figuring out ways to um, manage those hybrid systems so that you can effectively get those organics um, into wastewater facilities and start to do this on-site renewable generation. OK, AC versus DC. Uh, so so I, I, I think there's a lot of inertias, like historical inertias, or like, uh, that makes it um, slow to implement changes, uh, like so, uh, the, the one you're mentioning. So I, I th there are interest and work uh, for uh, people that like within buildings, they're starting to distribute more DC for uh, servers. But, but like they ultimately, they had to rely on availability of components that were built through an AC distribution kind of like network. <laughs> uh, for a power distribution, like long distance power distribution, there has been always a lot of interest on like using DC for power transmission. But um, it is like given that we have an infrastructure that is already established, it becomes much more difficult to say like, hey, let me replace that for a HVDC system. So like normally like all those work, all that work is easy, is uh, has a uh, easier time being implemented in the developing world, for example, or like uh, when they don't have that infrastructure that you can start uh, uh, deploying, for example, an HVDC system that replacing a working functioning one here. I wish I could see that. Like I, I really wish I could see, we can see more, more of those projects. But they require a lot. But like I, I know the DOE uh, is uh, working and have working groups on that. And, uh, and they're certainly. So just and a, a response to those two questions, actually. Those inverters, if they are close to load, they are very highly efficient right, right. now. So there's, there may not, not, not be a big advantage of those for that conversion. So they are in the very like 95 and plus. Plus, yeah. Uh, I think more than 98% conversion efficiency. Uh, so, so there may not be a big advantage unless you're thinking about transporting that generation over very, very, very long distance where you want to have DC transmission. Mm -hmm. um, and to the water heating part, I think that's highly interesting, actually, given that um, if just for the residential sector, water heating across the United States is probably 17% of total electricity demand, or yeah, closer to, to 20. And the strategies for water heating are really lagging behind uh, other regions across the world in terms of continuing to rely on, on big water tanks versus the strategies that you see in Europe where that's, that, that was never the strategy or the adoption. So there, there is definitely potential for innovation on that front and, and additional energy efficiency standards, yeah. Ram, anything you want to add here? Um, just on the uh, water heating uh, side, I think uh, one insight that we had here in the Bits and Watts lab was that by using much more accurate models, you can actually take one of these standard resistive water heaters and basically offer 24 hours of hot water just from solar. Yeah. Um, the lab, we have a the running 24-7 uh, electrified water heater testing uh, facility. Another thing is I would encourage you to talk with some European utilities, they have some bits and what's member here. The one idea they're talking about is really for the heavy duty electrified fleet charging, whether or not you can DC all the way go down to the charging right, to avoid AC, DC. Not efficiency issues, it's really like redundant, unnecessary equipment, AC, DC, DC, AC conversions. Let, let me, I mean, each of you describe the awesome research you have done in your lab. Then I will uh, pivot at different directions what is the remaining challenges you have, and how you can get support for the industry members and other colleagues we have here? Let's go from first speaker, from Inej to Megan to Wang. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that the challenges ahead are, are, are really quite daunting and, and, and numerous in terms of both the electricity and, um, and the transportation uh, sector. One of the things that we see is that for 
U.S. related challenges, we uh, can make use of really incredible publicly available data sources. Not ideal, but they are they are really quite good. When you try to scale the types of models and solutions that we're trying to propose for climate change mitigation globally, the challenge is much larger, and a large part of this is on really availability to have detailed data, as well as understanding of the uh, ongoing uh, policies. So I'd say that that remains an issue where input, in terms of a better understanding of um, data on both generation, emissions, transportation trends, and policies globally would be um, quite beneficial. Um, between the US, I think you saw snapshots uh, of the research from uh, RAM that highlight these issues, and from Michael too, that highlight these issues of three different aspects that we keep on trying to balance, uh, deep decarbonization, um, resilience, and environmental justice, and the overall economics. There's starting to be a bunch of metrics that can be used to quantify each of those dimensions, but where the research is still a little bit stuck and needs to push on those frontiers is really understanding a little bit more about the trade-offs across all of those. So any examples from um, your own experience on you had issues for decision-making that had both economics, sustainability goals, and specifically decarbonization, and understanding of how to quantify equity are things that I think we would love to hear more from and use as an input in our further research. The last one will be just, we benefit from here from the, this audience on what are some of the problems and challenges that you are prioritizing in facing because that's, that's what we can use to learn and to understand where our efforts may be best productive to find realistic solutions. So I'll end there. Yeah, Meg. Yep. Um, I'll be very brief because we're being told that uh, it's time to wrap up, and I think lunch is next. Uh, but I, I would say I think you know as academics we really benefit from the uh, sort of creative space to choose our first case studies. Um, but we really need help understanding how those case studies scale um, beyond just the, the first of a kind uh, demonstration that we might look at. And so perspective on challenges that we might face in other settings, um, as well as an opportunity to partner and help disseminate our work is really valuable. I, I, I think like for, for, for example, for in power electronics, one of like the, has been always a challenge, it's, um, we need to train people, and like it's, we need more people working in this, and it's uh, generally working in circuits, power, energy is not very glamorous. So <laughs> we need to do a better job at convincing and showing students that like uh, we have enormous potential to change, have a meaningful impact on the way we utilize energy, uh, and I think that's the main challenge. <laughs> I mean, I cannot understand why I'm the only person in power electronics in Stanford. We need more people. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, well uh, on the lunch time, uh, mind me already reminded me of uh, lunch. So let me quickly summarize. I think we've done a lot of wonderful job here, but we still have a lot of challenges remaining. You know, how to train the next generation engineer, produce more hardcore engineer in power electronic areas, how we talk about this morning speed and scale. We, have, we never lack of speed in Silicon Valley, whatever technology or startup companies, but how really scale the technology, right? Then how we create a really open framework, be able to share the data to help us to make decisions, to generate the matrix. And more importantly, when we consider this energy transition, how we consider the energy equity and just transition is very important. With that, I would thank all of you to stay here with us for, not, for the last 90 minutes. And I think all the speakers will be engaged during lunchtime. Feel free to ask any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.